In my earlier podcast, I talked about how the national crises of the 17th century, especially the English Civil War, affected Jesus College and how it pulled through. In the 18th and 19th centuries, nothing so dangerous touched Oxford or its colleges, and one has to wait until the outbreak of the First World War in 1914 to find anything comparable. It is often observed how quickly and unexpectedly Britain found itself at war. In the end of June 1914, an honorary doctorate was conferred on the great German composer Richard Strauss. German scholarship was much admired, and some Oxford scholars, including our then principal, Sir John Rees, had even spent time studying in German universities. Yet, by early August, Britain and Germany were at war. War broke out in the middle of the long vacation, when the colleges were empty, and the university authorities were caught completely by surprise. Oxford students quickly joined up to fight, and for all the early claims that everything would be over by Christmas, it became clear that Michaelmas term 1914 would be a strange one with so many Jesus students away. In 1915, emergency regulations had to be created to permit undergraduates to break off their studies to go and fight, with their places held open for them on their return, and young men about to come up to Oxford were likewise permitted to defer entry. Arrangements also had to be made for fellows and college servants who wished to join up. This is not the place to tell the stories of those men who joined up. Here at Jesus, we know of 67 men who never returned. And there were many others who were badly wounded, including Angus Buchanan, the college's only VC, blinded in Mesopotamia. Instead, we should look inside the college itself, denuded of so many of its members, and those left behind, anxious for news of former pupils, colleagues and friends. Just recently, in the archives, I found an important cache of letters and photographs sent variously to the principal, the bursar, or to the college steward by the families of servants killed in the war. They reveal a world of people devastated at the loss of a son, brother or husband, but yearning to hope that all will be well in the end. In reading these letters, we should think of their effect on their recipients, who would have known these men from their college days. Even at home, there were losses for the college. The greatest was when, in December 1915, Sir John Rees died in the principal's lodgings. Because of the current emergency, the college decided not to elect a successor, but arranged to be managed by the vice-principal, Ernest Hardy. Hardy thus saw the college through to the end of the war. Surprisingly, the college decided not to elect a new principal until 1921, and Hardy was the one chosen. By all accounts, Hardy managed college affairs very well, which is all the more remarkable when one remembers that by 1915, he had been totally blind for over a decade. College group photographs of the 1920s always show, poignantly, the principal wearing his dark glasses and usually looking in any direction other than at the camera. It is a sobering question whether any Oxbridge college has elected a blind head since Ernest Hardy. Rees and then Hardy presided over an ever-shrinking college, In Hillary term 1914, there had been 135 members resident in the college, but by Hillary term 1915, there were just 63, and by 1918, there were only 15 undergraduates left. By now, more or less the only students in college were those from neutral countries, as the USA was until 1917 or those exempt from active service on medical grounds. Unsurprisingly, student societies all faded away. There were no sporting fixtures, and no concerts, and the minute book of the Junior Common Room records no meetings held between November 1915 and January 1919. 
The college was not completely empty, however. As happened in most other colleges, its rooms were taken over for military training purposes. In our case, from 1916, we were used as a training base for officers of the Royal Flying Corps and remained so until the end of the war. We have yet to investigate the financial effects of the war on the college. Its estates would have continued to be occupied by tenants who could pay rent, and at least this time we could collect it. But the income it received from students for teaching, accommodation and food would have vanished. In some colleges, this made a great difference, but we don't yet know how badly Jesus was affected. There are hints, though, that Jesus survived the war in a decent financial state. After the war, a great many other colleges, such as Balliol or Univ, sold off a great deal of their land to put into stocks and shares to produce a better yield. But Jesus seems to have been content to keep its assets in land. Certainly, the college swiftly recovered in terms of personnel. During 1919, it quickly filled up with undergraduates. A few, like Angus Buchanan, had been up in the summer of 1914. But most were people who'd been offered places during the war, but been unable to take them up until now. But the memorials to the college's dead in the chapel and the old JCR, now the memorial room, will have reminded people of what they had endured and who they had lost. Just as the tribulations of the First World War were nearing their end, the world was affected by the last great pandemic before COVID-19, namely the so-called Spanish flu of 1918 to 19, which killed millions all over the world, including up to a quarter of a million in Britain. Two years ago, a researcher contacted many Oxford College archivists to ask about the effects of the flu in the colleges. The result was something of a surprise. Jesus was very typical among the men's colleges in that no one in the college seems to have died from it, and no official college records discuss the problem. It is possible that some of the RFC officers elsewhere in the college might have caught the flu, but we have no records for them. The picture is surprisingly similar for our old members. I consulted our admission registers for students who had come up between 1910 and 1918, and just three of them were explicitly noted as having died of influenza. But of these three, one died in Ceylon, another as a prisoner of war in Germany, and all of them died after they had left the college. However, We have just seen that by 1918, the college was severely underpopulated, with so many of its members away on active service. Therefore, there were very few people around who could catch the flu. By January 1919, when the college filled up with undergraduates once more, the flu virus had become less lethal. This, however, was the situation among the men's colleges. We need to remember that the women's colleges remained fully functioning during the war, even if some of them, like Somerville, had to move into temporary accommodation for a while. They were therefore more vulnerable, and tragically, some students at Lady Margaret Hall did indeed fall victim to the flu. Unlike the First World War, the Second World War did not come as a surprise. My own father, who was at Brazenose in the 1930s, once told me that he was almost relieved when war broke out, because the tension in the previous months had been so terrible. Therefore, there were opportunities for the university to get ready, and to come to arrangements with the government about how its buildings and the colleges could be used. Some colleges certainly were requisitioned for government use, such as Keeble, Merton and St Hugh's, and accommodation for their students had to be found elsewhere. But Jesus managed to remain on its site. Indeed, the then estates bursar John Baker, himself a veteran of the First World War, even observed later that college life went on with surprisingly little difference. For one thing, 
there were more students in residence than in the First World War. This time, undergraduates reading certain subjects like medicine, chemistry or theology were declared exempt from military service as they would be contributing to the war effort in other ways. From 1942, other students could come up to Oxford on six-month cadet courses, which combined military training with academic study and the offer of a full-time place at the end of hostilities. In the Second World War, therefore, Jesus managed to keep some kind of continuity going. Thus, the JCR held meetings all through the war, and college sports clubs and societies determinedly kept going by whatever means. So, even if there were next to no concerts given in college, the Music Society arranged regular so-called gramophone concerts, when people might sit in someone's rooms listening to recordings of some music, sometimes with talks given. Meanwhile, among the sports clubs, colleges regularly came together in twos or threes to create joint sports teams. Thus, Jesus College set up an alliance with St Catherine Society to create its sports teams. As the war went on, we were also joined in our sports teams by members of St Bennet's and Campion Hall. The one loss was our chemistry laboratory, now the Merrick Library. This was requisitioned for the innocuously named Tube Alloys Project, actually a British project to create nuclear weapons, which eventually became part of the Manhattan Project. Thus far, the Second World War may seem less frightening than the first. However, once again, the college had to brace itself for the deaths of its members on active service, 39 of them in all. Also, the Second World War brought a fresh danger, unknown to Oxford before. There had been some air raids and naval bombardments of civilian targets during the First World War, not least in London. But by 1939, bomber aircraft had become much more robust and their effects more alarming, as had been seen during the Spanish Civil War. There therefore remained for the greater part of the war a very serious threat that Oxford might face aerial bombardment, especially after the onset of the Blitz in autumn 1940. At Jesus, as with all other colleges, undergraduates resident in college had to take their turn in nightly fire watching, sitting on college roofs and being ready to warn if an incendiary device fell. Oxford was fortunate. In spite of the Morris works in Cowley, the city was never bombed. But throughout this period, no one was to know that fact. And these nightly vigils remind us of a perpetual tension which never quite went away. This has been, to be sure, a reflection on the darker moments of the history of Jesus College. And we have to be honest and admit that one day, the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 will inevitably be added to them. However, dark as these episodes have been, and perhaps the college's darkest hour was the Civil War, yet Jesus College and its members always have emerged the other side, and perhaps we need that reminder now more than ever.